a session this afternoon, this uh, Basic Science of Sleep workshop. We have uh, five speakers uh, scheduled to present this afternoon, and you can find uh, their titles and topics listed in your program. The first speaker uh, is um, Atul uh, Mahatra, who for many, many years, you will know is in Boston, but has just recently moved to sunny Southern California. So I'd like to ask uh, Tool to come up at this time and speak to us. Here's a pointer if you like it. Can you use it? Great, thanks very much, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me and for losing my slides. So these are backup slides, which may or may not be uh, uh, perfectly current, but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about upper airway tone and patency. I spoke at this meeting in the last year or two, and I believe a lot of clinicians in the room, but I'll try and give some of the sort of basic perspectives. I'm not a basic scientist myself, but I, uh, I play one on TV. Um, the uh, way I've broken down this talk uh, by way of introduction, recognizing I'm the first uh, speaker of this session, I'm first going to talk about sleep apnea as a perioperative risk factor and say, is it really a problem or not? And I'll try and convince you one way or the other. Uh, then we'll talk about the post-operative upper airway and say, is that really a problem or not? And what can be done about it? We'll talk about the sleep and sedation question, which Mervyn Mays and others have uh, uh, been very thoughtful about in the past. And then we'll say, what, what can be done about it uh, towards the end? This will hopefully segue into subsequent speakers. The first decent paper on this, I think, was by Peter Gay, who's not here, um, but was looking at the Mayo Clinic experience on post-operative complications of patients with sleep apnea undergoing orthopedic surgery. And the patients with sleep apnea who were either uh, diagnosed and treated, who were diagnosed and not treated, and then there was another group that was a control group. And suffice it to say, that those patients who were diagnosed but not treated had a, a fairly poor outcome as far as ICU transfer is concerned. And this to me was, was more compelling than prior studies. There were prior studies saying that sleep apnea is a risk factor for desaturation. I always thought such studies were nonsense because sleep apnea is defined by desaturation. To say desaturation is a risk factor for desaturation is not particularly insightful. But this one, when you're looking at ICU transfer and intubations and other sort of harder outcomes, I thought this actually had some legitimacy to it. It was a case control study. It was not a randomized trial. As we'll talk about randomized trials are very difficult to do in this arena largely because the event rates are so low that it's very hard to show an improvement in any sort of serious outcome. <clears throat> there was this large study by uh, Memsudis, is he here? There he is, yeah. Uh, which was, I think, some of the more compelling data in this area. This was uh, looking at non-cardiac surgery in two and a half million patients uh, and three and a half million patients, depending which uh, group you're looking at. The two and a half million was orthopedic, the three and a half million were in general surgery. And again, here they looked at real complications. It wasn't just desaturation or some ridiculous surrogate outcome. They're looking at intubation, mechanical ventilation. They're looking at other factors like aspiration pneumonia. Suffice to, say, suffice to say, in this Medicare registry, having a diagnosis of sleep apnea was certainly a risk factor. I'll show you some data. On the left are orthopedic surgery patients. On the right are generally sur general surgery patients. And you can say those patients with sleep apnea are overrepresented in the black bars compared to the controls who didn't have sleep apnea, or at least not diagnosed sleep apnea, consistent with an association between sleep apnea and these complications. It doesn't prove necessarily causality in the sense there may be something different, but those patients who received the diagnosis, maybe they're different healthcare delivery or different uh, risk factors or whatever else. But suffice to say, it's very large sample size. Real complications like intubation were more common in those with sleep apnea than those without. They use these propensity scores, which can be uh, ways of uh, identifying risk and, and for matching. Um, but we didn't really know much about sleep apnea severity or use of CPAP. And so, again, these are association type data, not causal per se. So to my mind, at least the data showing an association between sleep apnea and perioperative complications are reasonably consistent. The question is what to do about it. And I think the answer to that is not known. What got me a little bit concerned about this whole thing was um, this paper that was in the New England Journal a few years ago. This was in bariatric surgery, patients looking at risk factors. And the y-axis here is proportion, and the x-axis here is the body mass index. There's different groups here. Suffice it to say, those patients who had both a history of sleep apnea and deep venous thrombosis had very poor outcomes compared to those um, who did not. The deep venous thrombosis thing is not relevant for today's discussion necessarily, but those with sleep apnea did, did have a worse outcome in terms of uh, perioperative complications than those without sleep apnea. What was concerning was the following. 
What was written in the discussion was the following, whether an established diagnosis of sleep apnea is a marker of other factors predictive of adverse outcomes, perhaps because of screening among high-risk patients, or whether it's truly causal uh, wasn't clear. What came out after the fact that wasn't sort of in the paper was that the, some of the centers were screening for sleep apnea routinely, others were not, and outcomes were identical in those that did and didn't screen for sleep apnea, suggesting perhaps that uh, if it is a risk factor, it's not something you can intervene on. Outcome was the same at sites that did or did not look for sleep apnea. So questions, can uh, treatment actually make a difference here? Short answer is we don't know. So I want to say a little bit about the upper airway. I study the upper airway in humans for, for a living. Um, I've done less of that sort of work in, in uh, the post-operative setting. Uh, Matthias Eicherman, who's going to speak after me, has done some work with us in animals, and he's done some work in, in humans as well. So this will be a segue into what he has to say. If this is a human upper airway, we think of the balance of forces that are important here. There are factors that promote airway patency, and there are factors that promote airway collapse. The genie glossus is one of the upper airway dilator muscles that's fed by the hypoglossal motor nucleus that Richard Horner and others in the room have studied. That's a dilator muscle that opens up the upper airway. It's representative of other phasic muscles in the upper airway that help to maintain airway patency. There's also the factor of lung volume that uh, David Hillman and others have studied. There's a caudal traction force which helps to stiffen the upper airway, and so that makes the airway more patent. As your end expiratory lung volume goes up, it stiffens the airway and makes it less vulnerable to collapse. It's also factors that promote collapse of the upper airway, so negative pressure on inspiration. If you take a breath in like that, you have to drop the pressure in the back of your throat, and that can promote collapse back here at the upper airway. There's also extra luminal uh, factors such as uh, fat deposition, having a small mandible, potentially fluid accumulation as well can all contribute to uh, impaired mechanics of the airway and contribute to airway collapse. It was said for some time that negative pressure may not be that important because of this concept of flow limitation, whereby the harder you suck on the airway, the flows are quite constant. It behaves like a Starling resistor, and you get constant flow over a range of driving pressures. But some observations have been published relatively recently saying that, in fact, with increasing driving pressure, flow often goes down. It's a phenomenon that's referred to as negative effort dependence, meaning if you try harder, the flows go down. It's not like a Starling resistor behavior. It's a different type of behavior. The mechanisms underlying that are something we're actively studying now, but suffice it to say this negative pressure on inspiration may be a problem. And again, just increasing non-specifically ventilatory drive uh, may be problematic in patients who can effectively shut their airway uh, with suction pressure. So what's different after extubation? Well, there's protective reflexes which exist to maintain pharyngeal patency. There's one called the negative pressure reflex. If you suck on the airway, the genie glossus will activate as a way of uh, maintaining pharyngeal patency. Brad Thatch and Matthew described that in the early 1980s in animals and subsequently was shown in humans by Rich Horner and others. It's blunted after prolonged endotracheal tube placement. The reports in the literature of hypoglossal palsies where the actual uh, overtly uh, the hypoglossal motor nucleus and its output to v different muscles are impaired. There's more subtle forms of that where the upper airway reflexes are impaired after prolonged endotracheal intubation. There are also swallowing deficits, which are seen particularly in the elderly. Post-extubation, it's a fairly common problem clinically where people will tend to aspirate or um, have difficulty with their swallowing reflexes. There are also these residual effects of sedatives and paralytics. As we've been talking about, these drugs can hang around and affect upper airway motor tone. Upper airway dysfunction can be a problem in terms of patency. Reductions in mental status can also be an issue. Uh, abdominal uh, distension can also be an issue. And so the upper airway is different post-extubation for both mechanical reasons from the two, but also from the pharmacology that preceded it. And I have a thesis that's actually, it's a hard one to study, but I've been of the opinion for some time that the upper airway dysfunction is a major culprit post-extubation. It's likely under-recognized. When you have overt strider, the airway is very, very compromised. Prior to overt strider, there's air airway narrowing that can be problematic. It's not obvious clinically until there's a vert strider. It can contribute to many causes of post-extubation failure. Pulmonary edema is one. You'll see patients post-extubation who get pulmonary edema. That can be from a narrow upper airway and um, so-called negative pressure pulmonary edema, which is not uncommon. Aspiration can also be a function of upper airway dysfunction. These rapid, shallow breathing anxiety type patterns can be from upper airway dysfunction. As I say, strider is the most extreme example. But many of the causes of respiratory failure post-extubation 
can be a function of upper airway patency. When we look in the clinical literature, risk factors for upper airway um, compromise, obesity, and other risk factors uh, come to, to fruition as far as uh, risk factors for reintubation. It may be a function of upper airway control. This was actually never published. It was an abstract that was at the uh, critical care meetings. Gaytan Michaud, who's, uh, who's now in the Northeastern States, she was in Calgary for a while. Before that, she was in Ontario, worked with Paula Hebert. What they did here is they, uh, after extubation, they CAT scanned people to see what their upper airway looked like. And on the y-axis here, is the area in square centimeters. They looked at the supraglottic, maximum and minimum air areas, and the subglottic areas as well. Some of the patients got intubated and some did not. It turned out those that got reintubated had the narrowest upper airways, you can see here, compared to those that did not get reintubated, suggesting again upper airway compromise was a risk factor for reintubation in this particular study. I'm not sure why they never published it. I actually offered to help them get it out there just because I think it is important data. But both in the supraglottic and in the subglottic region, the narrowest airways are the ones that got reintubated. Here's some data from that particular uh, study. They tried them on CPAP as well to see what happened. You can see these very narrow airways here that get more distended uh, on CPAP here, suggesting one potential benefit of uh, positive pressure splinting post-extubation, maybe uh, providing patency to the narrow upper airway. So I want to say a little bit about sleep and sedation. Uh, we sometimes think of those two as interchangeably, and I think as Mervyn said, it certainly depends on the agent. Dexmedetomidine or Presidex may be a different drug from some of the ones we use, like benzodiazepines and propofol. And I think Mateus is going to talk more about the pharmacology of the individual drugs. <clears throat> so suffice it to say, uh, Cliff Saper, a former uh, or a colleague of mine, a former collaborator, uh, has defined an area called the ventrolateral preoptic area in the hypothalamus, which he believes is the sleep center. If you lesion that area, it can create an insomnia model in animals. And it turns out there's GABAergic type neurons that inhibit other sites. It just shuts off various neurons. The TMN is a histaminergic site of the hypothalamus. Uh, as potent arousal type pathways that can help keep things awake. And a relatively new area that Cliff has been uh, focusing on is the parabrachial complex, the PBC, which is certainly newly appreciated. It's been known for some time, but only recently has it been appreciated as a potential important site. It may be an arousal center, critical for various forms of arousal, including respiratory ones, also critical um, um, in, in coma as well. If you lesion that area, it can create coma models, whereas the traditional coma sites, are, it's harder to show. The studies with CFOS, which is one of the ways of uh, seeing which neurons are active, uh, showing the activity in the ventrolateral preoptic area from some anesthetics, which implies they're working through sleep centers. That is, if you look at the sleep centers, they light up with CFOS, suggesting the anesthetics may be working through that site. However, when you actually get into this, it gets quite complicated. So Ralph Lydic is a, a person who's very involved in the SASM. He's not here uh, today. Emery Brown is a colleague. Yeah, he is. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> He's just so quiet and modest. Neither, he's neither quiet nor modest, but uh. <laughs> say something bad about Michigan. <laughs> um, good. So, uh, so I say it's complicated. So this is a beautiful review. If anybody's interested in this topic, I encourage you to read it. But it's not something you can capture in a soundbite. Suffice it to say, these pathways are all quite complex. Emery Brown is a colleague of mine at, uh, at uh, Mass General as well. When it comes to the upper airway, though, there, there's fewer of these pathways that are, that are particularly critical. The hypoglossal motor nucleus is shown here. That's the one that feeds the upper airway muscles. And there's different pathways through that hypoglossal that, that may be quite important. Again, Rich Horner has done some of the best work in this area. The raphe neurons are, are serotonergic. The locus ceruleus ones are adrenergic. Pontine tegmental, lateral dorsal tegmental, these are cholinergic. There's also arexinergic ones coming from the hypothalamus. Why do we care? Well, it turns out some of these pathways here we, we're now working out in terms of the different reflex pathways. And we have different pharmacological agents we can try at least to try and maintain airway patency here. So serotonergic drugs, if life were simple, would simply hold the upper airway open. But of course, the, there's a million different receptors and, and the situation's more complicated than this uh, figure would have you believe. But suffice it to say, these different pathways are now revealing potential druggable targets we can use to restore upper airway patency, particularly post-anesthesia. This is just talking about that arousal system pathway. The, the, so Cliff Saper and Jun Liu are, are colleagues who were trying to find these different centers for coma 
and this is just to speak to the importance of that parabrachial complex, when they lesioned the, hyp the thalamus and other areas, they had little effect on EEG arousal. In fact, you can see the thalamocortical things had a very limited role as far as behavioral and electrocortical arousal, whereas this parabrachial complex in the pons was thought to be much more important, uh, relaying uh, information to the basal forebrain and other areas. So Cliff is now working on uh, defining the different aspects of that parabrachial complex as an arousal center. And potentially, there are druggable targets there as well, which could promote arousal, ideally to stimulate ventilation without affecting uh, the cortex and other areas that are, uh, uh, that are involved. There's also these velpo lesions. I mentioned this ventrolateral preoptic area in the hypothalamus, which is thought to be the sleep center. If you lesion that area, you can create a model of insomnia, as I mentioned. It's also a rigorous way of study whether the ventrolateral preoptic, the sleep center, is needed for different anesthetic effects. And Mateus Eicherman, Nancy Chamberlain, others have done work in this area. If you look at isofluorine anesthesia, for example, it doesn't seem to inhibit the effect of isofluorine. So if you lesion that area, and that area is how the drug is working, you would think the drug would no longer work. But in fact, there's no effect. The degree of neuronal loss predicts the sensitivity of different anesthetics. It doesn't seem to be the case that isofluorine is affected by a ventrolateral preoptic lesion. So this was published in, in Brain Research uh, relatively recently. If anything, the, the lesions to that ventrolateral preoptic area sensitized uh, to different anesthetic agents, suggesting, again, the drugs aren't working through the ventrolateral preoptic because when you lesion the area, it should stop working. And in fact, if anything, they're more sensitive, not less so. It's a hard area to study properly, though, and I'm interested in the discussion from, from experts in the room. There's challenges to studying the role of sleep centers and anesthetic effects. There's activation of many different sites, maybe epiphenomenon or irrelevant. So just because there's false expression in this part of the brain when you give an anesthetic doesn't mean that's the pathway through which it's working. GABA inhibits essentially everything, and so just because there's GABA projections there doesn't mean, again, that that's a causal pathway. This TMN, the, uh, temp uh, the tuber mammary nucleus in the is, is also a histaminergic area. It's a hard one to lesion in animal experiments, so it's, it's tough to study these things in terms of the basic pathways. Even the, the neuroanatomy experts have trouble getting a lesion uh, right there. <clears throat> so, so I want to say a little bit about these upper airway reflexes in, in humans as well, just because I think that, that is a, a, a potentially important. So this is a way of looking at that negative pressure reflex, the idea that if you suck on the airway, the genie glossus will activate. So on the y-axis here is the genie glossus electromyogram in a human. The x-axis here is epiglottic pressure. The concept here is if you suck on the airway, the genie glossus will activate more and more. And this is what we think is a very important pathway as far as maintaining upper airway patency is concerned. It's believed to be the case that anesthetics and other things will impair this reflex, although it's not as carefully studied. If you look during sleep, for example, so on the y-axis here is genie glossus activity and the x-axis here is epiglottic pressure. This is the same individual during wakefulness here, during sleep down here. You see a marked impairment in this reflex. Here, if you suck on the airway, the genie glossus activates. This is the negative pressure reflex. During sleep, there's impairment in that reflex, suggesting you can suck on the airway, the genie glossus doesn't do much of anything, suggesting uh, the, this protective reflex has been lost. What anesthetics do to this reflex is not Again, well studied in humans, but it's believed to be a, a loss of this reflex that's part of the reason for uh, reduced um, upper airway patency post-anesthetic. There's also this issue of REM sleep or, or dreaming sleep because um, this is a study Steve Shea, one of uh, our colleagues, did. On the y-axis, here's genie glass activity, here's epiglottic pressure. You can see a negative pressure reflex. You suck on the airway, the genie glasses activates here. At sleep onset, you see some impairment in the reflex. During REM sleep, you see actual inhibition here. And the reason this becomes interesting is David Hillman and I are talking about doing some experiments. The, the, the anesthetized airway under paralytics is very hypotonic in the sense that you've shut off motor tone, very similar to REM sleep. And we believe the mechanics of the airway during REM sleep may be similar to the anesthetized state under general anesthesia. In contrast, if you just give a sedative, it may be more like non-REM sleep. And so the the uh, certain anesthetics may recapitulate the mechanics during non-REM sleep, whereas more aggressive anesthetics and paralytics may look more like, uh, like REM sleep here when the, the airway gets very collapsible. 
just to illustrate that point, these are data on the, the so-called critical closing pressure, the P-crit. A very negative P-crit means a very sturdy airway. A very positive P-crit means a very floppy airway, and all gradations in between. So on the y-axis here is the critical closing pressure. The x-axis here are various different patient groups. <clears throat> in normal individuals, the P-crit is quite negative, meaning you have to suck really hard on the airway uh, to close it. These are data from Alan Schwartz and colleagues at Johns Hopkins. People with snoring or mild sleep apnea, the P-crit is less negative, more positive. And uh, for people with full-blown sleep apnea, it's a more positive value. If you look under neuromuscular blockade, this is, these are data from Shiro Sono and Chiba University in Japan. In fact, the values are much less negative, more positive. In fact, there, you get positive values here for patients with sleep apnea where the airway is closing on a mechanical basis. Again, this is more in line with REM sleep than, than with uh, uh, regular non-REM sleep or, or mild sleep apnea shown there. Just to prove to you that this reflex is important, I just want to show you some, some data on here. These are two individuals with identical airways. This person has a minus, has a P crit of minus 0.2. It's a moderately floppy airway. This is minus 0.1, again, a moderately floppy airway. Within the error of the measurement, these people have the same, um, the same mechanics. On the x-axis here is epiglottic pressure. On the y-axis here is genioglossus activity. For the person with sleep apnea here, if you suck on the airway, the genioglossus doesn't do anything, suggesting this impaired negative pressure reflex is one of the factors underlying their obstructive sleep apnea. This person with an identical airway, if you suck on the airway, you get robust activation of the genioglossus, again suggesting that the, this negative pressure reflex may be protecting airway patency in this individual, but not in this individual who has a crummy reflex. At least in theory, if you gave an anesthetic to this person, you could turn them into this person by impairing that reflex and leading to severe sleep apnea. It turns out if you study a family of individuals, it's all over the place. So some people have a very robust reflex, some people have a crummy reflex, and all gradations in between. So why do we care about that? Well, it turns out we can map these different pathways. And so Nancy Chamberlain is a, a neuroanatomist with whom we work. She can do these labelings of different synapses and neurons and, and see what lights up. So she can inject a pseudo-rabies virus vector into the tongue and monitor different synapses see what lights up. And so this is from the, the medulla uh, of the rat. This periobex region here is what lit up. And that's a, uh, here the hypoglossal motor nucleus, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, the nucleus of the solitary tract. This region here is what we think is quite critical as far as the negative pressure reflex is concerned. You can shut off the reflex with a pinpoint injection right there. It turns out this area is heavily cholinergic as well. So Les Jacobin has done that work where uh, these neurons were labeled CHAT, choline acetyltransferase, suggesting, again, there may be a drug old target here which affects that negative pressure reflex. So I'll show you some data on that. This is from the rat. You saw the, the raw genioglossus up here. The moving time average is shown here. Here's the airway negative pressure of the rat. If you suck on the airway of the rat, the genioglossus will activate, just like in the human. If you do a pinpoint injection of mucimol, it's a GABAergic type drug which shuts off neurons non-specifically at that periobex. Now you suck on the airway, the genioglossus does absolutely nothing. And the other thing that's interesting here is the baseline activity has gone up compared to here, suggesting it's working through a negative inhibition type pathway. We're quite excited about this because it suggests there may be cholinergic type targets that could activate this genioglossus reflex. And if you uh, look at some of the Alzheimer's drugs that have been used in humans, there's some signal that it may be helpful as far as sleep apnea is concerned, perhaps through this periobex region. Okay, I just want to say a little bit about this uh, idea of the arousal threshold we're talking about this morning. How are we doing for time here? You have uh, five, ten more. Okay, so, so there's this concept of the arousal threshold. I apologize the slides are out of order, but it was, uh, <laughs> they lost my slides. <clears throat> so the, um, the arousal threshold is the concept that some of us will wake up easily and some of us will sleep through anything. So some people have a low arousal threshold, meaning they'll wake up uh, with minimal stimulus. Some people have a very high th arousal threshold, meaning that they'll uh, sleep through anything. So I often say if one of my daughters cries in the middle of the night, my wife is more likely to hear them than am I, suggesting I have a lower arousal threshold, or I have a, a higher arousal threshold than does my wife, although she has a different interpretation to those data. So, <laughs> So, so, so the idea is, can you manipulate the arousal threshold here with different drugs? 
Why would you want to do that? Well, if you can raise the arousal threshold, you can allow the accumulation of respiratory stimuli. Things like CO2 can build up over time. Things like negative pressure in the, in the airway can build up over time. If you let that occur and you let the, 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 the stimuli activate the genioglossus, you may then be able to stiffen the airway in, in certain individuals and, and uh, protect airway patency. And so, in fact, some of these types of agents, like trazodone, may actually have some benefits as far as uh, airway mechanics is concerned. So y-axis here is esophageal pressure. That's a, a stimulus for arousal from sleep. And the x-axis here is CO2, and here's a CPAP, which is a way of uh, stimulating mechanoreceptors. If you give trazodone, in fact, the, the arousal threshold increases considerably so that somebody who wakes up easily will sleep through anything if you give them trazodone. It's not terribly surprising. We use this drug as a sedative hypnotic all the time. The fact that it raises the arousal threshold, though, is good news because it doesn't have myorelaxin properties. If you gave somebody alcohol or benzodiazepines or something, it might raise that arousal threshold, but then it would suppress the activity of these upper airway muscles. Trazodone doesn't do that. It doesn't have myorelaxin properties. The fact that it raises the arousal threshold is good news because it can then allow these respiratory stimuli to accumulate and, uh, and perhaps stiffen the airway. So this is a theoretical, it's the same figure I showed you before, but now I've drawn these two theoretical uh, red lines. The y-axis here is genioglossus activity, and the x-axis here is epiglottic pressure. These red lines are shown here. Some people have robust reflexes. Some people have almost no reflex. This is a low arousal threshold. If you gave a theoretical drug that raised the arousal threshold, you go to this red line here. For this individual, it makes no difference because they have a robust reflex. They never get those very negative epiglottic pressures, and so for this individual, it makes no difference. For this individual, it makes no difference either. They have such a crummy reflex. You're buying time in terms of allowing accumulation of respiratory stimuli. But in fact, the genioglossus reflex is so crummy, it doesn't really go up very much. And so for that person, it makes no difference. However, for this individual, it's more interesting. Here, you raise the arousal threshold from that point to this point. It allows more than a doubling of genioglossus activity. One of the most potent upper airway dilators can double its activity, and that would be predicted to stiffen the upper airway and improve the mechanics of that airway just by raising the arousal threshold here without suppressing this reflex. So we think of the arousal threshold as a double-edged sword. It's a low arousal threshold could lead to premature arousal with inadequate time to accumulate respiratory stimuli. On the other hand, a high arousal threshold could lead to substantial hypoxemia and hypercapnia with end-organ impact. So if you gave somebody that has a high arousal threshold, you gave them a sedative, they get very hypoxemic, hypercapnic, and that would be bad for them. Somebody with a low arousal threshold, you raise it, it might actually be okay because you allow accumulation of stimuli which can then activate the reflexes, activate the upper airway dilators and stiffen the airway. So therapies to manipulate the arousal threshold are likely to benefit some patients, theoretically be harmful for others. And so we're defining these different pathways uh, as we mentioned. So these are some clinical data from a, a drug Ezopiclone, or also known as Lunesta where we treated certain select sleep apnea patients with that drug to see what happened. On the y-axis here is their apnea hypopnea index, and the x-axis here is placebo versus drug. And you can see there's a statistically significant reduction in the apnea hypopnea index by giving a sedative. This is thought to be by raising the arousal threshold and preventing arousals from sleep. The accumulation of respiratory stimuli were potentially beneficial. However, it's not a cure for sleep apnea. There's still residual disease here. The residual apnea hypopnea index is around 14. Um, but there is an improvement, and thankfully none of the patients got worse, suggesting um, that it's a safe thing to do at the very least. And in some patients, they, they do improve sufficiently that you could argue that they're, they're actually cured. We're, we're now talking about combination therapy where you could give one of these drugs to raise the arousal threshold and then potentially a respiratory stimulus as well, and perhaps then you could eliminate sleep apnea in some percentage of patients. So manipulation of the arousal threshold and related pathways may lead to therapeutic strategy or for pharmacology of obstructive sleep apnea, again, may have relevance to the postoperative state. Just to prove to you that the, the mild dose of these benzodiazepines may mimic non-REM sleep, this is a group in Brazil that was working with us, Pedro Genta and Geraldo Lorenzi in Sao Paulo, Brazil, gave very low doses of midazolam, and they compared the mechanics of the airway in natural sleep versus midazolam, reverse that induced sleep. You can see here on the, this is a blind Altman plot uh, 
the mean is on the x-axis, the difference is on the y-axis. You can see most of the values are quite consistent, suggesting midazolam-induced sedation or sleep, if you want to call it that, looks very much like natural non-REM sleep from the standpoint of the mechanics of the airway. That doesn't give us mechanistic insight into how midazolam is working as far as um, the sleep centers are concerned, but does give us some physiological insight from the standpoint of the mechanics of the airway. The fact that this very light uh, dose of midazolam looks a lot like natural sleep from the standpoint of the mechanics is helpful to us in terms of uh, in interpreting the, the, the results. The other thing that's helpful sort of methodologically is we can now induce sort of very light levels of sleep with this drug, if you want to call it sleep, and uh, measure the mechanics of the airway, and that's become a model we can now use to, to study different uh, factors in terms of how they affect airway mechanics. So some of the manipulations we were talking about earlier, like hypoglossal nerve stimulation or jaw thrusts or body position, other things we could study in a midazolam-like state, and uh, it may be predictive of, of natural sleep based on these data. So what can be done in this post-operative period? Well, first of all, having a high index of suspicion for sleep apnea may be helpful. It may affect uh, what drugs you choose to do or how closely you monitor patients, as was mentioned earlier. You can use short-acting anesthetic drugs or, or these sort of scavenging type drugs that help to soak up the anesthetics so there's an off switch, as was just mentioned. You can do non-invasive ventilation or CPAP to splint open the upper airway. We've talked about a potential role for either CO2 or various stimulants, like these ampokines that can be useful. Uh, potentially to restore airway patency. And certainly careful monitoring, attention to detail, some of the things that Mark Opp was just talking about may be very helpful as well. So, so this is my uh, summary slide. Is sleep apnea a perioperatively a real problem? The answer is probably. There aren't randomized trials showing intervention is beneficial, but certainly the uh, Memsudis and other data are, are highly suggestive. Why is the post-operative upper airway a problem? It's based on mechanical effects of the endotracheal tube, also these pharmacological issues we've been talking about. Are sleep and sedation the same thing? I'll say probably not. The fact that the agents still work in the lesioned animals that don't have a ventrolateral preoptic area suggests to me it's working through different pathways. What can be done about it? About it? You can avoid complications. You can splint the upper airway. And certainly ongoing basic research into um, factors that can improve upper airway motor tone is absolutely critical. So I will stop there. I no longer have any, any uh, industry uh, sponsors. I apologize for the order of the slides. It wasn't uh, how I had intended it. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one or two quick questions while we change over the laptop. Any questions while I do double duty? I was intrigued about the, the, the story about what orexin and stimulation of um, genoglossus uh, or through the hypoglossal right? Um, and does, does orexin stimulate any other nerves or is it just that nerve? The orexin, orexinergic projection, uh, Richard can speak to that better than I can, but yeah, the orexinergic projections all over the place right. in terms of so, skeletal right. muscle tone. Yeah, so the orexin deficient. You know, narcolepsy with cataplexy is, is an orexin deficient state. Right, right. No, I, I knew about that, but I, I wondered about the orexinergic nerves going to the, to the um, hypoglossal because, and you probably you. know this, that, that all anesthetics, all that, that people have looked at, uh, decrease orexinergic firing. You know that. I didn't know that. I, uh, so, well, there are receptors on the motor neurons that are erectin receptors. That's been demonstrated. Not just hypoglossal, all the no, skeletal muscle, right? right yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said all, but I, there is an exception. Dexmedetomidin is the only one. But would that be because they directly inhibit erectin neurons that project elsewhere, or are they inhibiting other cells that therefore inhibit erectin cells? Well, we measured, um, we measured the CFOS expression in orexinergic uh, fibers, and um, we stain for orexin and we also stain for CFOS, so we double layer thing and show that in the animals that received anesthetics, bottles, barbiturates, um, the dad's lab, and propofol as well. Okay, I think with that we'll move on. Thank you once again, uh, Tool.
Our next speaker is Matthias Eicherman from MassGen, and he will speak to us about the interactions among anesthesia, sleep, and yeah, thank you very much um, for inviting me to uh, give a presentation on the more clinical ar arena um, of an operating room. And so I would like to talk a little bit about the, well, the more clini clinical concept of physiology of uh, upper airway muscle control. Um, and then focus on the effects of anesthetics, neuromuscular blocking agents, um, opioids and respiratory uh, muscle function. I will talk about two interventions that we have recently studied and will show you some, some prelimi preliminary data that might be interesting um, to discuss. So in terms of um, control of upper area muscle function, I think um, from a clinician's point of view, uh, it's interesting to, to think about the concept of respiratory arousal, which, which uh, comprises of um, brainstem reflexes as well as um, um, the cortical function, which promotes wakefulness. Because as we all know, uh, respiratory control is dependent on consciousness and as well as um, um, a well-functioning system in the absence of uh, consciousness. And um, so, we have um, motor neurons in the brainstem that are act being activated by, by respiratory arousal. And we have a co-activation of respiratory pump muscles and upper airway dilator muscles. So the interplay between up to upper airway dilator muscles and respiratory pump muscles is important. As we know, uh, collapsing forces are the upper airway, um, um, the, the, the pump muscles, the respiratory pump muscles. And they generate negative pressure in the airway. And that negative pressure, of course, would make the upper airway collapse if we wouldn't have the dilating forces, which basically are the upper airway dilator muscles. So the tongue muscle is the biggest upper airway dilator muscles. We have more um, than 10 relevant upper airway dilator muscles. And there are a variety of different um, um, uh, um, influences in the perioperative period that are important in order to um, lead to a disbalance. We have an increased um, um, effect of respiratory pump muscles if we are thinking about septic patients or if we are thinking about um, patients who are in respiratory distress and have an impaired oxygenation and respiratory pump muscles work harder and they g might generate a more negative um, pressure in the area of the upper airway muscles that need to be antagonized. And we have effects of anesthetics, neuromuscular blocking agents, and opioids. And on top of that, there are other um, <clears throat> mechanisms that in the perioperative period are important to consider. So we have inflammation, and inflammation affects directly the respiratory pump, uh, respiratory pump muscle function. We have um, pain and pain by reflexes via the phrenic nerve um, induces an inhibition of uh, the uh, activation of the respiratory muscles. And also you can have abdominal hypertension during surgery, but also um, in critical care medicine frequently uh, increased um, um, abdominal pressures and that in turn affects um, the preload and the um, the force output of the respiratory muscles. So anesthetics, but also um, surgery and the patient's primary condition that leads to um, hospital admission and pain are important. And all of them can lead to a compromise of the respiratory um, muscle function. So here, um, you know, um, the respiratory arousal can be affected by anesthetics and opioids, but also there is an endogenous impairment in the in perioperative medicine, which is important. So you can, might have delirium, patients with delirium, and these patients might have a cognitive dysfunction, and that leads to impaired respiratory arousal. And as a matter of fact, there is an association, an interesting association between obstructive sleep apnea and delirium in the perioperative um, period. We don't or uh, quite well how to interpret this and what the mechanism of this is. And on top of this respiratory arousal, there is a direct effect, as Richard Horner has, has demonstrated, of opioids, but also of anesthetics on, um, on the motor neurons. Um, so a variety of different mechanisms by which respiratory pump muscle function is impaired in the perioperative period. So now I would like to talk about, for one minute, um, do we always want to have a maximum activation of the respiratory pump muscles? So do we want to, to have medication that maximizes respiratory pump muscle function? And my answer is no. This is not what we want. Because if you think about the interplay between motor neuron drive and maximum muscle contraction, 
If you have a very high modern neuron drive in the post-operative period, and you have high um, force output of the diaphragm, of the respiratory pump muscles, then the patient is prone to injury. You can get a lung injury based on high um, transpulmonary <coughs> pressures. And this might affect the outcome of the patient. So there must be a healthy level of activation, which is definitely not maximum output, but it's also not minimal output, which leads to atrophy. At least it's pretty good, well documented for the respiratory pump muscles that atrophy can uh, really, um, uh, in a relatively short period of time of immobilization occur and may be um, meaningful. Of course, you don't also want to avoid to have such a condition where you have um, basically a high motor neuron drive and a paralyzed patient who has then um, um, a low respiratory pump muscle um, activity which leads to muscle atrophy and myth. So anesthetics. Um, I would like to show you these data that we published a couple of years ago and we are definitely not the first. Shiro Isono's group from Shiba has published on, on the effects of anesthetics, on the differential effects of anesthetics on upper airway muscle control many years ago. So we published this um, paper um, I think um, back in 2008 or so in anesthesiology looked at in, in the rat the phasic genioglossus activity tonic activity and we, um, we titrated the effects of isoflurane and propofol um, to an uh, equi anesthetic dose and found that isoflurane is a little bit more forgiving in terms of the air airway um, the later muscle activity. And another interesting finding was that basically the um, the uh, activation of the um, upper airway muscles was um, closely related to the ventilatory drive. So when a drug decreased um, ventilatory drive quite extensively, then the upper airway dilator muscle tone was also markedly impaired. So the concept would then be um, to find a strategy to increase the ventilatory drive, which frequently is impaired in the post-operative period. And in this RAT model, we showed that both hypercarbia and, and hypoxia, which are the, the you know, logical uh, pathways to in increase the respiratory drive, restore the genioglossus muscle function uh, to a level that was observed under isoflurane anesthesia. So that was in the RAT, and um, who knows if that really translates to humans. Um, so um, you talked about the PNAS paper that shows that um, uh, rodent models are not good for sepsis and I really doubt if rodent models are really perfect uh, models for um, looking at uh, the relationship um, between anesthesia and um, and breathing, so it's always good to add some additional uh, experiments. And this is one of our volunteers in my research laboratory at the Massachusetts General Hospital. So this is certified by the IRB. There is an anesthesia machine, as you can see. So there's um, the data acquisition software. We have a pneumotac. We have a genioglossus electrode here in place. We have um, mass pressure, we measure mass pressure and epiglottic pressure, so we have a life vest in place where we can measure changes in end expiratory lung volume. Yeah, so it's interesting, so we can put them to sleep. This is, by the way, a TCI pump, um, and we, um, in the US, with IRB approval, apply um, target control infusion with proper fall technology, which is not approved by the FDA, but uh, we convinced our IRB that's safe to use it, and it's probably safer than just uh, giving um, a fixed rate of proper fall uh, to a volunteer without knowing what we do pharmacologically. I want to show you some data. We just finished that trial. Healthy volunteers, two level of proper fall anesthesia, and then we administered at each level two different levels of carbon dioxide on top of propofol. We measured um, the variables that I already uh, told you that we are looking at, and we measured the upper airway closing pressure. I'm going to show you in a minute what that means, and we looked at breathing and genioglossus function. So this is a representative um, example of shallow and deep propofol anesthesia. We have max pressure, airflow, epiglottic, um, uh, pressure, which is the downstream pressure. It's pretty close to, the, I guess, the esophageal uh, pressure. Um, 
the pressure that is generated by the negative pump muscles. And this is the moving time average of the genioglossus um, signal. And you can see what, what anesthesia does, and most of us who work clinically know that. So it has a respiratory depression, so basically the epiglottic pressure, the negative pressure generated by the pump muscles decreases, and the genioglossus activity is impaired. So the drive to the respiratory muscles is impaired, and as a consequence, there's a decrease in minute ventilation. So now we measure upper airway closing pressure. So what is that? So we have a pressure transducer here in the mask and one in the epiglottic, one upstream and downstream. And then we have an artificial valve that occludes the airway out of the body. And then, um, of course, the, the volunteer will take a deep breath um, in response to the occluded airway as well. And then um, the pressures in the mask and the epiglottis both go down in parallel. But when the airway collapses, then the epiglottic pressure cannot go further down, uh, the mass pressure cannot go further down because of there's an airway collapse. And this inflection point between mass pressure and epiglottic pressure we look at, and I'll show you an example. So here is the airway occlusion, as you can see, and here are the breaths prior to the airway occlusion, and here are the breathing attempts uh, post-airway occlusion by an artificial wolf. And you can see that in the first glance, these two um, um, pressure lines go down in parallel, but then these lines separate as a consequence of uh, the airway occlusion. And then we look at the mask pressure by the time of the separation between these two lines, which in this patient was minus 12. So we can quantify the airway collapsibility nicely by uh, just looking at two pressures, one upstream and downstream pressure. And um, so here are some, some um, um, results uh, that we obtained in a volunteer representative trace. So this is um, propofol anesthesia, this is propofol anesthesia plus carbon dioxide. And you can see by the first glance that looks a little bit different. So what are the differences? So first of all, the upper airway closing pressure is more negative under propofol. And even more uh, pronounced are the differences here in the epiglottic pressure. Look at this, this is minus 30 or so uh, versus minus 20. It's a big difference. So the patient tries harder to breathe uh, as a consequence of the CO2 insufflation to the inspiration layer. The genioglossus activity is augmented and um, so the carbon dioxide uh, restores the, um, the upper airway function um, which is impaired as a consequence of propofol. And this is not only um, just a random observation but it's a significant finding. I'll show you the box plots here. So um, effects of propofol, awake, low dose, high dose, minute ventilation goes down, dose dependently, flow rate, a marker of ventilatory drive in the absence of air obstruction goes down. Uh, the upper airway closing pressure um, is less negative under deep propofol. Uh, you cannot measure that during wakefulness because during wakefulness the airway is so rock stable you can't just measure it. Um, duty cycle um, is um, the relative inspiratory time. There is some effects from wakefulness to propofol anesthesia, um, which is not favorable, but the inspiratory time is shorter. And then propofol has a slight stimulating increasing effect on duty cycle, which is not bad and has been reported by others, by the Hopkins group. So, um, but the net effect, uh, as you can see on P-close, is that the, uh, the upper airway closing pressure, as a consequence of increasing doses, is um, getting less negative, which is not good. So the upper airway collapsibility increases as a function of dose. And if you look at the genioglossus tonic activity from, from wakefulness to low and to deep propofol anesthesia, it goes down. And that might explain some of the effects of propofol on airway patency. So what does carbon dioxide add? Unpublished data, by the way. Some of you will see that paper relatively soon, I guess. Minute ventilation goes up as a consequence of propofol. And flow rate and the upper airway closing pressure uh, is getting more negative, which is good. So propofol really restores the, um, the impaired upper airway collapsibility. And duty cycle increases, which means there's a longer a relative inspiratory time, which stabilizes the airway. And there's also an effect of, um, prop, uh, of carbon dioxide on uh, phasic genioglossus activity, which might also explain some of the favor effect of carbon dioxide on airway patency. So, are all anesthetics the same? No. These are again um, animal data. Ketamine um, was um, given in three different doses, um, a very low dose, uh, ED50 and 1.5 fold ED50. And you can see in this representative tracing in the rat that is a respiratory stimulant. And that is the only respiratory stimulant to my knowledge. If you look at all the anesthetics, 
except for ketamine, there are respiratory depressants. I think even dexmedetomidin, but I haven't studied it. So if you look at, there are at least some, some reports that high dose dexmedetomidin might affect airway patency, but it might be more favorable than propofol and isoflurane. So what happens with ketamine if you compare it um, during um, so make comparison in um, EEG activity during wakefulness and um, sleep? And then you can see that um, there is um, slow wave sleep looks pretty much similar in terms of the uh, total power to high dose and low dose ketamine. And uh, the, the EEG total power is higher than during wakefulness. So how about the neck EMG, the peripheral muscles? There is um, ketamine clearly stimulates uh, the tone of the skeletal muscles, has been particularly at um, um, low doses. High doses as all anesthetics, you can, of course, if you give very high doses of ketamine, then also with this relatively forgiving uh, anesthetic, you can get um, a muscle relaxation, apnea, and um, asphyxia. So, Skeletal muscles, low dose at least, but we are talking about anesthetic doses, not, not you know, pain um, treatment uh, sub-anesthetic doses. All these rats were anesthetized with ketamine. So it's very similar with the genioglossus activity. Yeah, you see that um, quiet wakefulness, um, REM sleep, slow wave sleep, and then low dose ketamine. So this low dose ketamine actually um, increases the genioglossus and the neck muscle activity. And the combination of consciousness and preserved um, uh, muscle activity um, would I personally conclude that there is a dissociation between the unconsciousness and airway muscle dysfunction, and which we compared to all other anesthetics, uh, where always unconsciousness is paralleled by impaired um, uh, muscle activity. So these are the anesthetics. Anesthetics impair upper airway muscle function. Not all anesthetics are the same. I think I'm very keen on uh, looking at dexmedetomidin, and I believe that dexmedetomidin might be very interesting and, and might be even uh, you know, more broadly applicable uh, in perioperative medicine than ketamine. So neuromuscular blocking agents. So we published this paper last year in the British Medical Journal where we just looked at our uh, unicentric experience at the Mass General Hospital, looked at all patients who got muscle relaxant. Modern neuromuscular blocking agents um, like cisatracurium, rocuronium, vacuronium, and looked at outcomes. So we observed that patients who um, had non-debolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents corrected for a variety of different confounders had a higher incidence of deoxygenation post-surgery and also reintubation and unplanned ICU admission, which in our collective uh, translated to a quite high, um, uh, inc uh, quite, quite severe increase in mortality risk, this complication reintubation and unplanned ICU admission. So muscle relaxants are, um, you know, obviously relatively challenging to um, to titrate to our patients, and they might have some negative effects. So in a subsequent analysis, we looked at if the common strategies that we use in the OR to reverse the effects of, of neuromuscular blocking agents would uh, ameliorate these negative effects of muscle relations on respiratory outcome, and they did not. So we concluded in our collective, in our single center experience, the drug that are used to reverse the effects of neuromuscular blocking agents are actually not helpful. If anything, um, the, the, the incidence of desaturation was, um, was worse in patients who received neostigmine. Okay, so why is that? Because the upper airway is very vulnerable to lingering effects of neuromuscular blocking agents. You can see here uh, two movies um, of a colleague of mine who was an MRI scanner on the left side at baseline. I asked him to take a forced inspiration and you can see physiologically if you take a deep breath then the genioglossus muscle contracts such that the high inspiratory flow of up to 10 liters per second can pass the upper airway. And that is impaired um, well, it should, should run endlessly, but it doesn't. I apologize for that. So it is um, impaired. So even at the train of four ratio of 80%, which is a very, very low level of neuromuscular block, there is still an impairment of the, the genioglossus response. And, and that might be one reason why neuromuscular blocking agents um, have negative effects on outcome. Um, it's very challenging to detect. These patients are not uh, apparently weak. 
Um, so, and this quantitative neuromuscular transmission monitoring is not commonly used, so maybe we should uh, quantitatively measure the effects of neuromuscular blocking agent. Maybe that way we could exclude um, these lingering effects of neuromuscular blocking agents, which obviously have some negative um, um, effects perioperatively. There is another uh, mechanism that we recently looked at. So we looked at the effects of um, 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 of um, muscle strength and the propensity to aspiration. We are and we, we work with our speech and language the therapists the and our speech and language therapists. That's what they do. Um, for living, so they um, do a fiber optic evaluation of the patient. The patient swallows a bowl of blue dyed milk and then without they evidence give of the patient penetration blue penetration or dye, aspiration. And then they see what happens. Yeah? And then you can see that in a, in a second uh, when you get there the There is minimal residue in the follicula and piriform sinuses. You know, there's a minimal residuum and the blue dye is just gone. And um, I don't want to show you and bore you with the whole movie, but I'll show you what happens with a patient who is very weak. This is a representative patient who is weak. And then if you give the dye, this is what happens. Uh, this patient is unable to get rid of that bolus. And this Following is associated a trial, there's a with an um, in increased risk and of aspiration. He does not respond with a reflexive yeah. cough. So muscle weakness is not good. It translates to increased respiratory complication and to increased aspiration risk, so we should avoid it. How do we do that? Um, the field is open for discussion, so maybe the new reversal agent, Sugamadex, is going to be a solution, I don't know, um, um, if the FDA approves it. Maybe we will, use, uh, we will find other reversal agents that have less side effects even than Sugamadex. Um, Sugamadex, uh, as far as I know, is associated with uh, allergic reactions and, and also some increase in bleeding risk. Uh, if that's significant, I, I don't know. I think we just need more data to, to see and hopefully we'll find better reversal agents in future that um, help us uh, avoid these um, lingering effects of muscle relaxants. So opioids, I am not a specialist, but Richard Horner is, and this is probably an embarrassing uh, summary of the negative effects of opioids on, on breathing. But what I can tell you is that we have done a little study to see how can we decrease the effects of opioids on breathing in a vulnerable uh, collective of patients. And I would like to show you that, some preliminary data on that study as well. So we looked at patients and. Um, who presented for weight loss surgery, and we did a crossover trial in the PACU where patients got either CPAP or no CPAP, and we measured their breathing uh, with a pneumotac, and um, we also synchronized the PCA pump with um, our data acquisition software. So we were able to look at the, um, in the relation between opioid administration and breathing, and we were able also to see if CPAP treatment um, is beneficial. Now here are some of, um, I mean, why do we give CPAP? So this is again from our volunteer experiment just to show you what happens. So a patient at a CPAP of eight in this trial breathes normally, everything is fine, and you take the CPAP off. Someone who's on propofol anesthesia, no good. Yeah? So this is not an occlusion maneuver. This is just the, 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 um, the situation where CPAP is taken away from a patient who obviously needs it because um, he or she, in this case he, was under the influence of um, anesthesia. So the uh, patient tries very hard uh, to make strong efforts here, the epiglottic pressure, which you know is a, a representation of the activity of the respiratory pump muscles, and even the genioglossus muscle activity is augmented under these conditions, but it doesn't really help the airway collapses. So what did we do? We had a just uh, old-fashioned wall circuit. We just had a, a peep valve and a high-flow CPAP um, circuit. We have um, also um, um, <clears throat> we increased the temperature, normalized the temperature of the high-flow circuit, such that the patients did not have negative sensation of the, uh, as a consequence of the high-flow CPAP uh, circuit. And here is what happens. Yeah? So if um, the, since we have also an EEG recording in our setup, we can see that during wakefulness to onset of sleep, during wake, uh, sleep-wake transition, the, um, the um, 
minute ventilation drops. And this is true for CPAP and atmospheric pressure.